Welcome to our WebEx on Cooling Tower and Condenser Water Piping Design. This will be a two-part seminar, and so as usual, we have to have a place to begin. So let's begin with what we're hoping to accomplish in this two-part seminar. We want to understand the functions of a cooling tower and how it operates. What does it do for a living? What does a cooling tower do? There's some basic terminology without going too deep, some very minimum terminologies that you need to fully understand if you want to play with cooling towers. We want to look at airflow and water side flow requirements of a cooling tower. Are the mins and maxes on flow rates for cooling towers and condenser water piping? We want to look a little bit, how would you do the chill plant piping? How would you pipe to the condensers and multiple cooling towers and multiple chillers back to them? What's a proper way to do that? There's also some current code implications in Mount Portman 2010. Uh, that are becoming code throughout the country that we want to see how that impacts the way you might pipe cooling towers. And last but not least, and to me some of the most fun part of it is, what are some common mistakes we see made that we could avoid if we just think ahead a little bit? So as a place to begin, and this is uh, one of my pet peeves, let's look at the cooling towers. Let's look at the chiller plant piping. And you might see on the left hand side of your screen a cooling tower and the cold water piping, the condenser water pump running through the condenser. By the way, uh, blue being cold, red being hot. And that's the part we're going to talk about in the seminar a great deal of our time. On the far right hand side of your screen, you'll see the load. Whether that's a, a chilled water cooling coil or whatever it may be, that's your 45, 55 degree side. That's where you're keeping the owner or the customer in the building happy. Between those two extremes, in the middle, is actually a, a refrigerant cycle. I want to start with the refrigerant cycle because nobody ever really talks about it anymore. And this is the part where you have a compressor, an expansion device, a condenser, and an evaporator that you've got a refrigerant cycle going on inside of. We want to talk about that just a little bit so you understand what impacts the KW on that thing. Where is the operating cost being influenced on a chill? So between the condenser water side and the chill water side is the chill. Could be a centrifugal water cool chiller, could be a reciprocating chiller, could be a screw machine. We don't care. But let's look at that basic refrigerant cycle as a place to start. Now I like defining a refrigerant very simple. If you know the pressure of a refrigerant, you know the temperature. If you know the temperature of a refrigerant, you know the pressure. That's what it makes it kind of unique. You see all these service guys running around with uh, little tubes and little, uh, little gauges and sensors. All they're trying to do is they'll hook onto the compressor cycle. If they can get a pressure anywhere, they know the temperature. And, and that's what they're after to know how well they're working. So let's start with the compressor motor at the bottom of your middle of your slide. So that little blue would be low pressure vapor, low pressure refrigerant vapor gas. And I'm going to, so what I've got on the blue side, on the cold water side of that compressor is this. I have a low temperature, low pressure gas. I'm going to take my compressor and pump it up. I'm going to pump it up to a high pressure, high temperature gas. See how the pressures and the temperatures influence this? So the low side is a low temperature gas, high side is a high temperature gas, and the pressure difference is the key. So the amount of work being done by your centrifugal machine, your reciprocating machine, is how much lift you have. It's just like a pump. How much is the head? What is the lift between the low side and the high side? How much work are you doing there? And that's controlled by the condensing temperature and the evaporating temperature. So coming out of the compressor, we now have a high pressure, high temperature gas going to the condenser. I wonder what a condenser does. Condenser condenses it. It takes the BTUs out of that high pressure, high temperature gas and makes it to a high pressure, high temperature liquid. And those BTUs, 85 degree condenser order, 95 going out, the condenser condenses the liquid transfers the BTUs over to the cooling tower, and the cooling tower rejects the BTUs out in the atmosphere. That's what the cooling tower does. Now I have a high pressure, high temperature liquid, and I go to the expansion device at the top of the slide. And what's an expansion device? It's an orifice, it's an expansion tube, thermostatic valve, some way to reduce the pressure. And what happens when I reduce the pressure? I reduce the temperature. So I'm taking a high pressure, high temperature liquid, I'm going to reduce it to a low pressure, low temperature liquid, Wow, now I've got my cold liquid refrigerant, and I take it to the evaporator. And what does the evaporator do? It takes warm return water, 55 degrees, 
sucks the DTUs out, takes that low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant and makes it into what? A low pressure, low temperature gas. And coming out of the evaporator, we got nice 45 degree cold water. Going on to the compression end, we have a low temperature, low pressure gas, and we start the cycle all over again. What I want you to learn, nobody really talks about that basic cycle. That's the same cycle you have on a water source heat pump. It's the same cycle you have on a air cool heat pump at home. It's the same cycle you have on your refrigerator at home. It's the same cycle that's in your car. And everybody involved in this business needs to understand that. And from a cooling style tower standpoint, what have you learned? You've learned that that condenser water temperature controls the pressure, temperature and pressure in the same way refrigerant. And that's the amount of work the compressor's got to do. So wait a minute, maybe by reducing the condenser water temperature a little bit, I might have less KW going to my centrifugal chiller? Absolutely. Those are the things I want you to learn and keep it back in your mind as we go through this because we've got to look at the energy and you need to understand the basic refrigeration story so you can understand what falls. Now, if we go through this, why have a cooling tower to begin with? And it goes back to the refrigerant temperature. It goes back to the work. Very simple. A cooling tower takes latent heat. And another little simple statement I like to make is if you take a, a pound of water and make it to a pound of steam, it takes a thousand BTUs. You take a pound of condensate at zero and you condense it to uh, 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 excuse me, a pound of steam, you can use it to a pound of condensate, it's a thousand BTUs. Steam tables might be 980, 960, let's just use a thousand today. So a thousand BTUs will take a pound of water to boil it off. In other words, if I could take some BTUs into my cooling tower, for every pound of water I could evaporate to water vapor in my tower, I can soak up a thousand BTUs. See, a cooling tower is a latent machine. It's not worried so much about the sensible temperature in the atmosphere. It's worried about that wet bulb. It's worried about how much moisture can I put in the air because it's going to evaporate the water at the rate of 1,000 BTUs per pound to soak up the energy in the cooling tower. So that's the key thing to learn. So what does it do for a living? It cools water by evaporation. That's a couple of kids, and as kids growing up on the farm down east, when we got hot in the summertime, we did not have air conditioning. But we learned pretty quick, if we put on a bathing suit and went outside and got wet, the evaporative cooler would keep us comfortable. If we still could not get cool enough on a 100 degree day, we did have fans. So we'd wet ourselves down, turn on the fan, and guess what you have? You have the evaporative cooler, 1,000 BTUs per pound. Your body is now the fill of a cooling tower. You got, got it wet, and that's how cooling tower works. So if you ever doubt how cooling tower works, just go back to the youth, been outside in a sprinkler, running around, getting wet on a hot day, and you know how cooling tower works. In fact, on a 100 degree day, getting you wet, turning a fan on you, and controlling the amount of air going by your body, I could make you shiver. I could get you so cold you couldn't stand it on a 100 degree day. What is CTI? A couple of little things you've got to learn. Cooling Technology Institute. That's a standard. The standard, by the way, is now in ASHRAE 90.1 2010 and required by building code. All cooling tower manufacturers belong to this. It is just a way of stating what a ton is, what are the conditions, how do we compare one tower to the other. So if you're going to specify anything, you've got to make sure you always have this in your specifications. It's not brand specific. All brands belong to it. It's kind of like ARI or UL. It's just a standard you've got to go by. And looking at that standard, they define a cooling tower tone. And the cooling tower tone is defined by CTI is different than a refrigeration tone. The refrigeration tone is 12,000 BTUs per hour. And by the way, that comes from melting a ton of ice or 2,000 pounds of ice in 24 hours using the heat of fusion, which is 144 BTUs per pound divided by 24 hours. You can go check me out. It's not the weight of the machine. I like to tease people about that because young kids coming out of school sometimes think a thousand tons. Chiller sure weighs a thousand tons. That's not the issue. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just trying to have a little fun with this. But it is 12,000 BTUs per hour on the chilled water side. And on the condenser side, on the cooling tower side, it's 15,000 BTUs per hour as defined by CTI. Wow. 
why would it be a different number? Do you remember that heat of vaporization? Do you remember the KW we were putting into that chiller, in the compressor, to, lay, to raise that low pressure, low temperature gas to a high pressure, high temperature gas? That's work. That's KW that you're putting into the centrifugal or reciprocating motor. And that KW winds up in the cooling tower load. And nominally, that would be 3,000 BTUs per ton, as defined by CTI. So CTI says if you buy a cooling tower and it's rated for 1,000 tons, it's going to be rated at 15,000 BTUs per ton, not 12, because of the compressor. You've got to take that KW that you put in the compressor, those BTUs wind up where? Out in the cooling tower. And you have to get rid of them. they got to go back. you got to take care of them. So from now on, cooling tower is 15,000. And that's the standard CTI definition, and every cooling tower vendor will use that same number when they tell you certified. So we got to talk a little bit about more about conditions and standard conditions for CTI. If you look at a standard condition, everybody worried, or thinks this is a standard condition, not, and CTI defines it as the standard condition, the range would be 85, 95. In other words, I'm going to make 85 degree work. I'm going to have 95 degree water coming back from my uh, chillers or my condensers, and it's going to get 10 degree range. And I'm going to do it at a 7 degree approach. I'm going to do it at 78 degree wet bulb. So here we go. Normal statement would be 85, 95, 10 degree range, 78 degree wet bulb. That's a 7 degree, 7 degree approach to the 85 degree condenser what I'm making. And that works out to be 3 GPM per ton with a 15,000 BTU hour ton. This is all a lot out of ASHRAE, but it's nothing magical about it. The reason I mention ASHRAE here is because that's where you're going to go to find your conditions for Greenville, South Carolina, or LA, or Alaska. Wherever in the world you want to go, you go to ASHRAE and you look to determine what your local design wet bulb should be. And when you do that, you soon realize there's nothing magical about this nominal condition. So here we go. In our, in our local part of the world where I live in Greensboro, the nominal is 78, and that's pretty much right out of the book. But if you were in uh, Mobile, Alabama, it's 80 degrees wet bump. That's right. Much higher humidity. You go to Las Vegas, it's 71. Yeah, 71 degree wet bump is designed. You know, in the summertime in Vegas, it gets 100, what, 105, 110 degrees sensible. But the lake never gets that hot. Remember, a cooling tower is designed on the wet bulb, on the latent, on the ability of the air to hold moisture, on boiling off one pound, a thousand BTUs per pound evaporation rate. That's what controls how a cooling tower works. So you size towers based on the wet bulb, not the dry bulb. Size a cooling tower based on the wet bulb and not the dry bulb. And you can see out west the dry bulb, the wet bulb's a lot lower. So you can certainly say the cooling towers be more effective than they already are. So nothing magic about normal, nothing magical about nominal conditions. And if you're going to design in Charleston, South Carolina, you've got to use 80 degree wet bulb or you're not going to be very happy. So as we work our way through this range thing, let's talk about it a little bit. We said the nominal range was 10 degrees. That would be uh, making 85 degree condenser water with 95 going to the tower. And that was 3 GPM per ton based on 15,000 BTUs per ton. Good. What's wrong with, uh, with 15 degree range? What's wrong with making 85 degree water and having 100 degree water back to the tower? It would reduce our flow rate from 3 GPM per ton down to 2 GPM per ton, as you see. Nothing really wrong with it. it Whatever's best for your application, best for your children. There's no one answer to that. But I want you to make sure you learn this one thing, and this is a real fundamental thing that you need to relate back to the refrigeration story. If you have a nominal 95, 85 degree range, What's the midpoint? The midpoint is 90 degrees. So on average, I am condensing that refrigerant at 90 degrees. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Compare that to the 85 to 100. What's the average temperature? Average temperature is what? Let me figure the 92 and a half degrees. So there, my average condensing temperature on the 15 degree range is 92 and a half versus on the 10 degree range is 90. So on the same application, 
the centrifugal chiller has to work harder because the condensing temperature controls the pressure. Remember that on refrigeration storage. The temperature controls the pressure. The higher the condensing temperature, the more work the chiller's got to do. It doesn't matter. The more work it's got to do, the more KW you have on the electric bill. But wait a minute. So you're telling me in the 15 degree range delta T that my compressor is going to work hard. Yes, every compressor in the world is going to work hard. But wait a minute, I've reduced the condenser with a pump flow to 2 GPM per ton versus 3, so I've got less pump horsepower. Which is best? I do not know. I can't answer that. But you've got to look at both. You've got to look at the increase in the K to the chiller and the decrease in the pump as you look at this to determine what is best for your application. Be happy to help you with it if you want to get there, but it's important you understand those two relationships if you're going to play with towers and chillers and pumps. So how about this cooling tower approach thing? We said 85 degree water we were making with 78 degree wet pump. Same degree approach, nominal. What's wrong with a 5 degree approach? What's wrong with making 85 degree water with 8 degree wet pump? Nothing. It works. Cooling tower is going to be bigger. What's wrong with 80 degree water with 74 degree wet bulb, 6 degree approach? Nothing. Cooling tower is just going to be bigger. That approach temperature, the, the higher it is, the smaller. The closer the approach, the bigger the tower. And it's first cost. You're talking direct control of the first cost. Again, what is best for your application is the key. So let's look at a typical cross-flow cooling tower, double-sided, hot deck bin on the top. I've got water going in the hot deck, little tiny holes, and the water just flows by natural gravity all over the field, keep that, keep that field nice and wet. I've got air pulling in from the side, say 78 degree wet bulb on design, and I'm making 85 degree water at the bottom. On the cold deck, the blue part at the bottom, and the cold part, that's where the cold water basin is. So if I kind of put a few numbers of this thing to make sure you understand what approach is, by controlling that airflow going out the top, I can control my leading water temperature and hold it at 85. On a nominal day, I'd have full capacity and tonnage, 78 degree wet bulb going in both sides. It's a double side tower. I'd have 95 degree water going into my hot decks at the top. I'd evaporate 50. 15 pounds per ton, wow, throwing something new at you, not really. I said the nominal tonnage is 15,000 BTUs per ton, well, cooling tower ton, 15,000 BTUs per ton. So if we get 1,000 BTUs per pound of water, then I have to evaporate 15 pounds of water for every ton in my cooling tower. Simple little thing that you ought to hang on to. It's not exactly 15, but it's so close you can use it and go on. So you're saying to me, Chris, for every ton of load on my cooling tower, I'm going to evaporate 15 pounds of water. Absolutely. Let's keep it simple. That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to have rocks left behind, by the way, which we'll talk about later on. But you're going to have to do that. So now I'm making 85 degree water, and what's my approach? My approach becomes 7 degrees. And that's what I want to make sure you understand. That's about all the terms I really want you to understand, but you need to kind of make sure you're comfortable with these approaches and the range and the flow rates. Because you start that evaluating cooling tower, it is critical you do that. So let's keep going with a typical design project to have something to play with. We're going to use this through the, the whole session and keep, keep coming back to it a little bit. But what I want you to realize is you normally have multiple chillers, multiple pumps, multiple towers. So the question is, how do we pipe? What's the proper way to pipe? In this case, I've got three 500 ton towers. I've got two 500 ton chillers, and just to keep it interesting, I have one 300 ton chiller that we pick for the wintertime operations, kind of a core load on the building, so we can just get by on one chiller. To keep it simple, I'm going to use a 10 degree range, which means my pumps would be 1500 GPM, three GPM per ton on a 500 ton chillers, and of course three GPM per ton on a 300 ton chiller. That's going to be the basic little example we work with the rest of the time we have to get. So kind of keep this in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to it shortly. I just want to define what it is. Three towers, three chillers, unequal size. And you might see that one common supply pipe, red being hot, 95 degree water out to the towers, has to be sized in the summertime on what? Full flow, 3,900 GPM. 
the little blue, blue line coming back with the 85 degree order has to be sized on 3900 GPM. But wait a minute, you said, Chris, I'm going to run this project, hospital, whatever it is, in the wintertime with a 300 ton chiller only online, which means my flow right now is only 900 GPM in the wintertime. So the big question you need to answer, the critical one you need to understand is, when I run that single smaller 900 GPM chiller, how do I size my pipe? What happens to the friction loss in that big piece of pipe? I just sized it for 3900. What happens to my pump hit? How many towers do I run? Do I run all three towers on that one little, that one, one little chiller? I do go back to one. Those are the questions that are getting people in trouble because they're not asking. We're going to ask those questions as we go forward. I don't want you to begin to think about great to design it UI. Everybody got that figured out. What are you going to do in December? How are you going to operate it at reduced load? And that's where we need to get. So we're going to move on a little bit first and we'll come back to this in a few minutes. So that's my design basic project I'm going to use and we're going to talk about it. And so you kind of understand where we are. But let's look a little bit at location of towers first. And, and, and this becomes interesting because it's something, again, people don't think about enough and they don't relate to enough. Here's my cross flow tower again. I got hot water in the hot water basins at the top, say 95 degrees. I got cold water coming out, let's say at 85 degrees. And again, remember, I'm assuming I've got 78 degree air coming inside. I'm going to control my fan speed. I'm going to evaporate 15 pounds per ton out the top of gut. Sounds great, right? Now, what happens on the air and come to that tower if I do something to the cooling tower like put it up next to a building? Think about it for just a second. If I put it too close to the building and by the prevailing winds, as you see in the slide, coming from the left to the right to the building, and I'm kicking out the top of the tower this warm, moist air where I evaporated 15 pounds per ton, so that wet bulbs got a lot higher, hotter than 78 because I'm adding moisture to it. I'm getting that approach close to 85 degree water up there. So I've got this warm, moist air coming out the top well beyond design of 78 degree wet bulb. It might even be 82, 83, 84 degree wet bulb. Now where does prevailing wind take that moist air to? Ah, over to between the building and the inlet of the other side of the tower. So now that tower is getting more and more stare and will not give me 100% rated tonnage. And that ain't my fault. I keep using that term in my seminars because people got to wake up. I can't control that. If I'm selling a tower to you, I can't control where you put it. But do you not understand how critical that is? Per CTI, there's a minimum D distance in there to get you away from the building to get rated capacity, CTI capacity, out of that tower. And if you violate that, you can't get it and you're going to have issues. How would you know if this is a problem? Well, if you talk to a maintenance man, man or an owner or operating person, and they're complaining about, I can't get 85 degree water. I can only get 86 or 87. My condensed water supply temperatures are too high. Well, is it because you put the tower next to the building and it can't, cannot evaporate the 15 pounds per ton? Let's go back to simple things. If it can't evaporate the water, water temperature is going to go up. Secondly, you have higher head pressures. Remember that connection I was trying to teach you. Higher temp condensing temperatures, because if you put it next to the building, lead to what? Higher, higher pressures on my refrigerant side. Wait a minute. That means that my compressor's got to work harder, too. And that means your operating costs go up, and you can't get the same amount of tonnage. So the last statement all makes sense, I hope, to you. If your condensing temperature is higher because you put the power next to the building, then you've got more work to do to get your, get your refrigerant pressure that high. It all goes hand in hand. Here we go with a typical example. This happens to be a hotel in Wellington, North Carolina. And we got a complaint. That tower up between the two sides of the building there, a nominal 100, nominal 100 ton tower, will not get you 100 tons. I wonder why. And by the way, before you forget it, the, t the tower outside works fine. The one out in the air could get 100 tons. The one between the two walls of the building could not. Take another look at that. What is on that wall up there? You don't want to lick that wall. Just pick it at you. But what I'm saying to you is you see the tower between the two walls. That's the airflow. Now, 
that wall is green. You don't want to get near that stuff. That's going to be bad. Do you under, begin to understand how the warm moist air would just wrap around and around and around? And there's no way you're going to get certified tonnage out of this thing. There's no way I could get 100 tons. The best they could do was about 50. And to make matters worse, what do you think that exhaust pipe is above the tower? That is the natural gas exhaust from the laundry. So you've got natural gas products going out the top. Warm moist air going round and around and around. You got carbonic acid in, in the tower. So the tower lasted about six months, ate away, tore it up, would not get ready capacity, and it ain't my fault. And you guys have got to begin to realize there's some common sense here. You've got to have a little common sense and you've got to start recognizing problems like that. Very common everyday issue with towers that you should at least use a little common sense when you're looking at one. So there is a minimum D distance away from a building, the tower has to be in order to have the CTI ready capacity. In our particular example, remember we had three 500 ton cells. So this would only apply to a specific brand. So whatever brand of tower you have, you have to go to that specific vendor to see what these dimensions are. This is a particular vendor, but it's not going to apply to everybody. So if I'm looking for the 500 ton tower, or the 491 would be the nominal tonnage, and three three cells, I'm looking at 12 and a half feet is the minimum deep of doggy that I have to be away from the building to maintain CTI certification on my towers. That's a simple statement that you can understand. Here's another one for you. You know, uh, I like towers. I think they're pretty. For some reason, some people do not think they're pretty. They want to put walls around them. You put walls around them, you have the same issue again. You're not going to get ready capacity. In this case, at least the bricks had a few holes on them. You go design something like this, go to your vendor, find out what the reasons are, find your tonnage, and they can help you put these, figure these walls out if you want to do it. Every vendor, again, this is called a well installation. This is another deep a doggy. In this case, if I have 500 tons, you can see three cells would be 17 feet. I have to have the tower 17 feet away from these walls in order to have a chance at having rated CTI capacity out of these towers. Simple statements, but I think you begin to understand how critical it is to maintain good airflow on anybody's Cuban tower to stay out of trouble. Are there flow limitations on towers? Interesting questions. And the answer is yes, they are. But let's look at a typical Cuban tower cell. Are flow rates critical? And the answer is yes. And a lot of people ignore this, and I want you to start thinking about it. Is there a max flow through every tower? Yes, there is, and if you get over that, you go on the hot water basins and it's going to start flooding over going on the outside of the tower, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Wasted energy, wasted chemicals. If you've got cold weather and you exceed the capacity of the tower to handle the flow on the max side, it's going to freeze up on you. How about on the low side? Is there a minimum allowable flow on the low side? And the answer is yes. Uh, before recently, most towers, unless you specified it differently, would have turned down 20-25%. In other words, a ton tower, design flow is 1,500 GPM. If you had 20% turn down, that would mean that tower's minimum allowable flow would have been 1,200. If you had 50% turn down, that means the minimum allowable flow on that nominal 1,500 GPM tower would be 750 GPM. Now, what we're trying to tell you, get below that, the towers don't work correctly. You start having issues. What kind of issues would you have? Lower capacity, you can't get the tonnage, you can't evaporate 15 pounds per ton. Fans run on high speed. Wow. Are you telling me if I don't put enough water to the fill of a cooling tower, my fans are going to speed up and run high speed? Yes, because you cannot maintain leaving condenser water temperatures. You can't do it. Operating costs are going to go up if your fans are running high speed. You're going to have more scale, more rock, more maintenance, all bad things. This can easily be handled in your guide specifications if you go ahead and specify that all towers be, uh, be mandatory turn down to 50%. It's something called a weir dam, which I'll show you a picture in a minute, helps you do that on a cross flow. But also, ASHRAE 9.1 2010 Energy Code now dictates all cooling towers have to be 50% turned down to meet ASHRAE code. 
So that's coming your way. So now you're dealing primarily with the older towers that probably don't have that turn down. So if we pull all this together in a flow limitation, here on the left-hand side shows overflow. That overflow, as you see, the hot decks are just, the water's just going right off the hot decks down the side. What a waste. You get extra pumping costs, chemical costs. And if you've got cold weather on that tower, it's going to freeze. Right-hand side. That's the rear deck. That's in the hot deck itself. We just put a little piece of metal across the top of the hot deck, and we dam it up to make sure the face of the tower always has some water on it. That is never a passageway where the air can go dry air through dry field and out the top. We want that air to always have to pass through some moisture somewhere on the face of the fill of that tower to make it keep working. And that weird dam will let you go down to 50%. Pretty easy, easily done. So what's the message here? Here's a cooling tower getting ready to operate, that you did not put enough water flow, that you underflow the tower. You don't have the required flow rate. You're operating the tower flow-wise down below, below the minimum turndown, whatever that number may be. So what happens? Well, you've you got your fan sitting there trying to maintain 85 degree condenser water with a verbal speed drive. So you're trying to maintain 85 degrees by controlling your fan speed and maintain 85 going back to your condensers. Okay. Now, if you don't put enough water into the hot decks to keep the, fire, to keep the field wet, you've got dry air coming in from both sides, you've got a bunch of field sitting there, and a lot of it is not wet because you're too chintzy with the water. Now, if you've got a bunch of field not wet, dry, and some field that's wet, that dry air is going to seep the passage of least resistance through that field. You know, it feels pretty close together. And where it's wet, you got a fair amount of air resistance because what are you trying to do? You're trying to evaporate 15 pounds, oh, excuse me, a pound of water for every 15,000 BTUs. That's what you're trying to do. But where it's dry, there's very little, very little air resistance. So the dry air finds the dry passageways, passes right through the tower. The fan's sucking that dry air right out the top, and it goes away. And what happens? So you condense the water temperature going back to the, to the condensers. Nothing. It's absolutely cannot maintain 85 degrees. It tells the tower fans to do what? Run faster and faster and faster. These towers have dry air disease. They ain't working too good, guys. Come on. It's a terrible problem to have, and a lot of people don't even recognize it. What does it look like when you underflow a tower? Right like that. That's what happens. So you get dry and wet, and right in between, you start building up rocks. Look at that. All of that can be solved with a weird end. That's another picture of a hot deck with a rear dam in it for 50% turn down. And all I'm doing there is make sure there's no way, no passages, where the dry air can get through. It might have a little bit coming in, but it's always going to get to a part of the field that's wet, so my tower still operate. What else would it look like? Yeah, I think you kind of got that in flow limitations, and I put dollar bills on this thing. This is still out of the cooling tower in one year. Yeah, one year. One year. You know why? It's expensive. The field collapsed. It's got rocks all over it. How come? The flow rate was too low. This particular situation was a hospital. They had three big cooling tower cells. In a winter time, they had one little chiller that needed to run to maintain conditions in the operating suites in a cold weather. Yes, guess how many cooling towers they ran in the winter time with that one little small chiller. They ran all three of them. They ran all three of them. They had dry disease going. They just, just were putting rocks all over their towers. That ain't my fault. There is a minimum allowable flow on those towers, and you better pay attention to it, or you're going to be having big bills like this. The next thing they did was they blamed the chemical treatment guy. It ain't their fault. The chemical treatment guy is just going to make it worse. That's all the rocks are going to come out. You add more rocks in there, it's going to dry out again, all because you didn't have enough minimum flow. I mentioned this ASHRAE 90.1 2010 thing about the pitch percent turndown. It was an addendum that came out. And as the addendum came out, it got passed. So this shows the addendum, but this has been passed. It's been approved, and it's actually in 90.1 2013. It is also part of 90.1 2010 because it got accepted as a part of that, part of that code. And you might note in red it says 50% flow turndown ratio is the minimum. So if you specify 
that your towers be ASHRAE 90.1-2010 compliant, then you're going to get 50 cent turn down. And I would suggest you go ahead and do that. It's a simple little thing, but you ought to have guy specification should have it in there. How about condenser water itself? How about looking at the condensers themselves? Is that an issue flow-wise? And the answer is yes. There's a minimum max flow there. If you overflow the condensers, you're going to erode the tubes. Most centrifugal or reciprocated condensers have a max velocity of eight, eight and a half, nine feet per second, somewhere in that ballpark. And if you get it up much beyond those numbers, you do keep them clean, but you start eroding the tubes and they get real thin and you can really have a mess. Furthermore, why would you waste all that pumping energy? Why would you put all that KW and all the flow something that doesn't want it to begin with? That doesn't make a lot of sense. On the minimum side, is there a minimum flow rate? Yes, there is. Most of your major centrifugal chiller manufacturers today still preach constant flow to the condensers. Let me repeat that. Most of your big time major centrifugal chillers and reciprocating chiller manufacturers today still preach that it's more efficient, more economical, to have constant flow through the condensers. That's how you can't vary the flow. But once you get it running, once you get head pressure under control, you get it up and running, they would suggest you keep constant flow. Go check that out. Not the main brands, but you whatever brand you like, go ask the question. On the minimum flow side, if you get the flow rate too low, the tubes foul quicker. You get more problems. You get higher head pressure. You get unstable operation. You get more scaling or more rocks on the inside because velocity the higher the velocity, you have to keep it clean. You lower the velocity, those rocks and scales start getting inside the tubes and you lose efficiency. And as your efficiency goes down, your KW goes up. So they're all bad things. So basically, there is a max and a minimum flow. We would suggest you have constant flow at this time until the chiller vendors change their minds. Today, they preach pretty much that, that, that message. So let's go back to our example. Let's go back to our multiple towers and multiple condensers and ask you a simple question. How do you pipe? How do you pipe? Let's look first at independent circuits. And the best way I know to do this is going to show you a slide. It's going to show you a picture. Here's independent circuits. I've gone back to my example of the three 5 ton towers, my two 5 ton chillers, and one 3 ton chiller. And now what I'm doing is I actually have a separate set of pipes for each one. Actually, you really have three uh, three chill plants combined into one piping diagram. That's really what I've got. They're all independent. So as you see, each tower has its own chiller, its own pump. Uh, I guess the things you would say about this, I don't see much of. No, you don't see much of much of this because of the first cost. You're running three pipes up to your towers, and three pipes back. That doesn't make a lot of sense to people. Furthermore, there's really no standby here. You have no way to switch one chiller to another tower. So we don't see a lot of this, and I think in summary, and I'll give you the summary slide, I think you would agree, is uh, could be the very way, very best way to pipe and easy to operate. Even Chris could operate that. Notice what I'm trying to do is stage it. If I stage on that little 900 GPM chill in the wintertime, it's pretty easy. I just turn it on, turn the other two off. I got no problems. My flow rate's fixed. I'm not worried about many max flows. Everything is easy, so it's, it's easy to operate. It's simple to pipe and balance, but first cost is more. First cost is more. I have no flow staging issues. When I go to stage chillers back and forth, I don't have any issues. It's simple, but no standby. No standby. And I do have multiple pieces of pipe out to the chillers, from the, excuse me, from the chillers out to, out to the cooling towers and back, which probably is not going to fly. And to be honest with you, I see very little of this. However, it would work. There's nothing wrong with this. Let's go to a header supply and return, which I think might be the most common way that we see towers and chillers and pumps pipe on the condenser water side. Again, back to my three 500 ton towers, and I've got my three chillers. I've got a 1500, a 1500, and a 900 GPM. So now I've got one set of pipe, that red pipe, one common pipe to all three cells going out with my uh, 95 degree water. And I've got one common pipe coming back with my 85 degree work. This is what I think you see all the time. You see the two-way valve at the top of the tower, the two-way valve at the bottom of the tower? You need them both. And those are two-way on-off valves on the hot side and the cold side. 
So when that power cell is not running, I would want those two-way valves closed. When the tower cell is running, I want those two-way on-off valves open. And they work together. The one on the top and the one on the bottom of each cell cycles together. Same signal, same thing. Let's keep talking about this a little bit. Now what have I got? Well, let's see. Summertime conditions, I've got, what, 13,900 GPM through that pipe going out to the tower and 3,900 GPM coming back. But wait a minute. That means I've got to pick my pump heads. My three pumps have to be picked for that condition. That's when I have the highest friction loss, the highest pressure drop in those pipes. It's at 3,900 GPM. And in the summertime, I've got to run all three pumps, and each pump's got to have enough head to be able to overcome that. So my pump head is going to be based on full flow, 3,900 GPM through the pipe, where that friction loss is. Now, you've all been taught that, that if you double the flow, Friction-wise, the head goes up four times. You cut the flow in half, the head goes to 25%. Now, the lift of the constant or the static piece of the condenser water pump head would be the lift between the whole deck and the hot deck in each tower, which is 10 to 15 feet, whatever it may be. If you had a spray nozzle, you've got to add that in there. In this case, with a cross-flow tower, there's no spray nozzle. And what is that pressure drop through that condenser? Because I want a constant flow through the condenser. So a big piece of this pump here is constant. The verbal piece is the friction piece, the piece in that piece of common pipe that varies as I vary the flow. So you look at a condenser or a pump head loss calculation, you need to be thinking in terms what piece of that head loss calculation will vary as I stage to chillers, and what piece of that head stays constant if I'm running one pump or multiple pumps. And we all got to change our way of thinking to get the concept in mind. So right now we have summertime conditions, and my question is what happens in the wintertime? I want to run one pump, one 300 ton short, one 900 GPM pump in the wintertime. And it's got to go through that same piece of pipe size for 3,900 GPM. So what's happened to the friction loss? Well, the friction loss, let's see, 3,900 GPM was 100%. If I go half times a half, I'm 1 16th. I'm the 1 16th at 900 GPM of the friction loss I was at full flow. Basically, at 900 GPM of flow, the friction hit has just gone away. I don't have any. Is that a problem? It's a problem with high head pumps because they may run off to the right hand side of the pump curve. They may put too much flow through the condenser. They could erode the tubes to the extreme. What's reasonable? Most condensed water pumps are 60, 65, 70 feet ahead max, and I don't think you have a problem if you get with a pump vendor to make sure you pick that pump properly. We're running in trouble on that. Now, if you've got 100 foot ahead on the condenser, another ball game, we need to slow down and see why it's 100 feet and how much is that is friction. So the question is, and you told a condensed water pump head, stay out of trouble, how much of that is friction? Let's summarize that a little bit, because we've been rambling around a little bit, bringing it all back together. Summer. The, the common pieces of pipe going to the towers and back have to be sized for all chills at 3,900 GPM. So the question is, how will they operate at 900 GPM? That's the question we're trying to ask. So the next statement is, what is the, the, the pump is required to plug in 3,900 GPM. So you've got to pick your pumps as if you've got full flow through the pieces of pipe at high friction loss. What will the operating problems could be when you run one pump. You may go off to the right hand side of the pump curve with one pump running with the head picked for the summertime condition. You only got one pump running in the summer in the wintertime, and that friction is basically gone away. You might need a flow limiter on the chiller to protect it. You might have to add a flow limiter. Uh, another little comment you're going to learn about ASHRAE 94 one water side economizers, you might also have to add another set of pipes out there. In other words, with one pipe to the towers and one pipe back, you can only get one whole water supply temperature at the time. It can be 85, it can be 65, it can be whatever you want it to be, but it can only be one temperature with one set of pipes. So you've got head pressure considerations for your chillers. They may want water at 70 to 75 degrees, maybe as cold as they want it. But if you're trying to run a water side economizer, remember you want as cold water as you can make. So how do you handle those two extremes with one set of pipes? Last but not least, as a dedicated pump per chiller, and I like that because when I turn the pump off, the flow stops. And I'll show you that again in a few minutes. I have a dedicated pump for a condenser, and I want to make sure you kind of follow that logic. So here we go. 
you might note there's a pump per condenser. So if I turn that bottom pump off on my 900 GPM condenser, the flow's gone away. So it, it, I cycle my chillers and my condenser water pumps together. Just turn them on and off together. When I turn the pump on, the chiller has to flow through it. I turn the pump off, the chiller does not have to flow through it. Very simple, but there's a good reason for that, as you'll see in a few minutes. Now, we talked about the fact that if we had high friction loss in a common supply return pipe, we might have to add flow limiters. So all I've done in this particular slide is added that flow limiter. And that flow limiter is set for 900 GPM on that chiller to make sure I don't overflow that chiller and possibly erode the tubes. That's simple. That's all I'm attempting to do. And you see how that works. Now, somebody said, I want to add a little standby to this. Okay, fine. Then I can add a couple of butterfly valves, and I've got more standby available by adding two butterfly valves between the pumps, and now I am able to swing any pump to any chiller. I've got a flow limiter because i got high friction loss to make sure I don't get in trouble, and that's pretty much what you're going to wind up packing. Now, one common sense statement would be you do not normally need flow limiters. And you can, we can help you figure out if you do need it, you can always sit down and work out the numbers. But basically, normally you don't need them unless you got high pump heads on condensed order pumps. That's when you might need them. How about parallel pumping? How about if we pipe it like this? And you see the difference? I've got three pumps together now, pants tight together, with a common discharge to three condensers. Now back it up real quick. See here, I've got a dedicated pump per condenser. I turn the pump on, the flow that the condenser is on, I turn it off, there's no flow. In my new situation, parallel pump, there is a single pipe over two to three condensers, and if I turn one of those pumps off, I still got flow in the condensers. I still have a 90 GPM flow. So now I've got a, got a different set of circumstances. First of all, if I'm going to put three pumps in parallel, I want all three pumps to be the same size. So in this case, if I'm going to have three pumps, I'm going to have parallel pumps. I want each pump at 1,500 GPM. Could I put a 900 GPM pump there? Yes, I could. Could I make it work? Yes, I could. But I'm living on the edge. I'm making it complicated. Why? I like simple things. I prefer three pumps, parallel pumps, to be the same flow rate. All right, now I've got no problem. If I cut off the 900 GPM pump, my curtain won't pump off, what's going to happen to the flow through that chiller? Nothing unless I do what? I have to add a two-way on-off valve. Can you see how I've added a two-way? And another problem might be, and this is Chris Edmondson speaking here, what would happen if I, if I valved off the 1500 GPM, the two 1500 GPM condensers with the two-way on-off valves, and I did not have a flow limiter, and I ran all three pumps? You'd be trying to put 4,500 GPM through a 900 GPM chiller, and if you did not have a flow limit, if you did not have a flow limit to listen to me, you would erode the tubes and destroy that chiller. You will erode the tubes out of that chiller. So I'm saying to you, Edmondson's saying to you, you want to, if you're going to pipe them this way, fine. Parallel pumping works great. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you're smart enough to recognize mandatory. I've got to have a flow limiter on each chiller, and I've got to have a two-way on-off valve so that chiller's not running out of valve at all. If you'd accept those two pieces, you're fine. So kind of in summary again, parallel pump should have the same flow rate and the same head on each pump to keep it simple. Mandatory, in my opinion, that you have flow limiters on each chiller so you don't run three pumps through one chiller and erode the tubes. And I have done that personally. I've seen it happen. It's not my not funny. Third, you must have an automatic two-way on-off valve. And that's by code. ASHRAE 90.1 2010 dictates that. that. If you take a chiller offline, you've got to stop the flow through the condenser. And the only way you're going to do that is with two-way valve. Uh, on the positive side, it's great for standby. You can take any pump, any chiller, any chiller, any pump, and any chiller, any pump, any cooling tower. So it's got the maximum amount of standby. And a lot of the old process engineers love this because of the standby. But what I found is those old process engineers that love the standby know this stuff, and this is what they're doing. They know how to do it. But don't do this unless you recognize the requirement for the flow under and the two-way valve. If you do that, you'll find there's not a thing to roll wrong with. So let's back up and let's ask the question again that we started this conversation with. How are you going to run that little small 300-ton chiller 
in the wintertime. How are you going to stage it? So let's look at staging sequences of operation and ask the question. Now I'm going to set this up the way I like to pipe things. I do like them piped this way. I do like a dedicated pump for sure. I prefer it this way. This is the way I like to do it. So we're going to do it this way. You can do it any way you want to. This is a place to start. But I want you to get in your mind that an engineer needs to slow down on all the chillers and do what we get ready to suggest to you. This is your responsibility as a design engineer. So what have I got here? I've got three fire zone towers. I've got in pipes with a dedicated pump per chiller, headed pipe as we call it. I've got V1 and V1A on the towers that work together on off. V2, V2A on the towers, they work together. V3, V3A work together. I've got chiller three, pump three. You turn pump three on, chiller three has got flow, turn them on and off together. Same thing with P1 and C1, and you see the sequence. So here's my question to you. It's wintertime. I want to run that little 300 ton chiller. I want to run P1 at 900 GPM and C1, which is 300 ton chiller. So I've turned the pump on, I've got flow through that. I'm going to turn P2 and P3 off. Question is, how many towers do I run and which one? Do I run T1, T2, T3? Do I run them all? What do I do? Now this is where it gets to be tricky and this is where people are getting in trouble. So let's ask that question and let's walk you through what I think is a fundamental design tool you should be doing on every project. So here's, let's take the situation. The statement is I got three 500 ton towers. Each one of them has weird dams in them and the allowable turn down is 50%. So the minimum flow rate for any one of my towers is 750 GPM without getting dry air disease. So here, so I got a minimum flow of 750. My max is 15. Could be a little bit older than that, but let's just use 15 as a max flow rate per cell. And I want to see how you stage them. What staging sequence are you going to give to the control vendor? You cannot give this to the control guy. He, they, he or she may not understand what you're doing. You have, to dis, you have to give them the sequence and they'll program it, but you've got to tell them what sequence you want. And what other staging sequence is not shown would be allowed. And the reason I ask that question, if you, if you can give me some I'm going to show to you, you are understanding what we're trying to do. So let's take the big step here. I'm going to ask you to slow down for a second. Bear with me with all this because this is simple, not complicated. And if you'll follow this simple little procedure, you'll stay out of trouble and you won't have dry air disease. So here we go. I got three towers. I got weird dams in my towers. The minimum allowable flow rate is 750 GPM. They're 500 ton towers, 10 degree range, 3 GPM per ton. So the 300 ton tower has a flow rate of 900, and the 500 ton towers have a flow rate of 15. So let's look at go through a little staging sequence here to see if we can understand this. Let's start off with a wintertime operation, the little 900 ton chillers online. So P1's on, C1's on. P2, chiller 2, chiller 2 is off. Same thing for 3, it's off. So what is the flow rate going out to my towers? 900 GPM. Great, great, great. I got 900 GPM on the towers. Now I got T1, T2, T3 towers available, and I got the shutoff valves, V1, V1A, V2, V2A on each one. Now if I went ahead and valved off tower 2 and tower 3, they're off. My flow rate through tower one would be what? 900 GPM. Is that acceptable? Absolutely. The minimum flow rate is what? 750. The max flow rate is what? 1500. That's an acceptable operating condition. That's fine. No problems. No dryer disease. Great. You got one fixed. Let's turn the pump one and chiller one off. And let's turn on number two. In other words, you got chiller two online, pump two online, chiller one and chiller three off. Total flow rate now is what? 1500 GPM. Great. So now we've got 1500 GPM going out to the towers. How many towers are we going to run at what flow rates? Well, let's, let's start off with the condition. Okay, let's let T1 and T2 be on. Let's take T3 off and valve it off. And that would give us, if it was balanced properly, what? 750 GPM per tower. Is that an acceptable operation? Absolutely. It's above the 750 minimum established by the weir dams it actually might be slightly more efficient than running one. So that would be okay. Is there another operating condition I could run here? Sure, I could run one tower at 1500. Any one tower could have been 1500 GPM, and that's fine, and I'll not get prior disease, and that's an acceptable operating condition to tell the control person. I think you begin to wake up a little bit now, hopefully. Now, I don't want to insult you. Let's go through another one. Number three, 
I've got a little tower, a little, excuse me, a little chiller, and one of the big chillers online. I've got C1 to C2 online. I've got C3 off. I've got a dedicated pump per chiller, so I cut the pump off. I don't have any flow. My total flow is 2,400 GPM. Great. I got 2,400 GPM going out to three towers. How many towers are you going to run? Well, in this case, uh, I looked at having T1 and T2 online, which would give me, what, 1,200 GPM per cell. I've got T3 off, and is that an acceptable operating condition? Absolutely. It's more than 750, below the 1,500. That's fine. You can tell your control man that's a great place to run. What else could you do here? What's another option? Well, what would happen if we turn all three towers on at 800 GPM each? Would that be okay? Yeah, three divided by 24, three to 24, 800, 800 GPM each, and I'd be above the 750, below the 1500. Might be more efficient. You got to go to the tile vendor to see how it works out, but it actually might be that situation. But I don't want to insult you too much. Let's go to the very bottom. I think we've done enough of these. We'll go to the very last one, so you can kind of make sure you summarize this. Basically, the last one, I've got 3,900 GPM, all three chillers running, all three towers available. In that particular situation, as you see, I've got 1,300 GPM per, per cell, all three cells online, all everything running wide open. That's the summertime condition. Perfect. Now you've got every particular potential operating condition covered. You picked up on the 1,500. You picked up on the ones on in my chart. So that was your test to see if you understand what's going on. Now you've got this thing documented as to what a proper sequence would be so you wouldn't get in trouble. Now what do you do? You take that and you give it to the control vendor. The control vendor does one very simple thing. They control what you told them to do. So C1's online. They go look at T1 if it's working, and they go ahead and say, yes, they turn T1 on. They bow T2 and T3 off. You don't do this. This is what they do. They do the program but you have got to get in the sequence. Otherwise, you're going to have dry air disease. And when they get through, they'll keep building this thing up, and they'll wind up one of these charts kind of looks like that. This is what they wind up in. But they don't know the min and max flows of these towers. That is your responsibility. That's what you've got to do. You're the, you're the person responsible as designing the systems. So to make a long story short, we have to give them the sequence and that tablet form, and then you're doing your job properly. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.